method that I use is using whatever leftover oil is inside of whatever car or pot I have. Now the next one is going to be probably even easier than this one, and it's going to be getting a dab heater. Now I know a lot of you probably don't know what that is, but it's pretty much just a syringe filled with already THC distillate oil or even live rosin, live resin oil, whatever your choice is. Main purpose is literally to just fill up disposables or carts, all right? It's extremely easy to use, and the only reason I didn't do that today is because I couldn't really find any within my area. So moving on to the last the way to make carts at home and this is probably going to be the most time consuming and probably the hardest one you might even waste some product and that is pretty much just going to be either getting shatter or whatever type of concentrate you want and mixing it in with terpenes there are a lot of companies out there that offer like kits that come with terpenes and all you have to do is just mix it and then it lowers the viscosity so you can put it inside of a disposable or a 510 cart now me personally i don't like using that method because not only is it harder but you're diluting your actual concentrate by adding like nasty ass terpenes that usually nine times out of ten are strain specific right so that's not really my preferred method and actually now that I'm thinking about there's actually one more method which is pretty much just going to be growing your own flower, pressing it out, and then figuring out a way on yeah, turning that shatter Yeah, if you just grow your own flower in Illinois, I would have already been doing that. Hot maize, you get fucking jailed for it. But that right there is literally just two times consuming for me. It's a lot of good They treat you like you're growing heroin in your backyard. It's Illinois makes weed legal, but they can't make growing legal. Fucking idiots. And if I did, don't forget to leave this video with a fat like, a comment, subscribe to the channel, and catch you guys on tomorrow's video. Dude, fucking great punch or great crush is so good. Ugh. You guys must be having overgrown dicks if you think you can play this shit. Sydney. Mike Hastings, West Point graduate and veteran. Hastings fought to invest in our police and has a plan to reduce carjackings. Honored by Illinois Chiefs of Police, endorsed by Illinois firefighters. Mike Hastings, fighting to keep us safe. Explain this to me, Brian. The apparently... The, we talked about Gunther and Seamus the other day on television, and it looked like that Gunther tapped out in his match. He was in the Cloverleaf or whatever. Right. And he tapped out, and but the referee was looking at it and then, and then waved it off. Well, he tapped twice, I believe it was. Well, he tapped twice. He tapped. And we said, I said, what was that supposed to be, right? Because he obviously was tapping, but yet WWE she said, no, it wasn't. Corny. <laughs> and I didn't understand it. <laughs> and you did not offer up any fucking instant explanation for that either when I was telling you I didn't understand it. So are you claiming now you understood it? No, I'd still say the same thing I thought there. He tapped twice, so I think that's why it wasn't officially a if WWE tap. And, and it wasn't also... City cannabis, definitely like, oh my god, I'm in pain. It was kind of like, ah, oh, what the fuck? Great. That was my well, argument was, then, and that's still what it was. It was odd. Like. It was off-putting. And now we uh, potentially have an explanation here, and actually it was explained in some 
unclear method on SmackDown this week. But this is an email from Joseph. Dear Jim, and parenthetically, and Brian, I suppose, Gunther on the last episode of SmackDown was using a trick from the world of Brazilian jiu-jitsu called the Brazilian tap. A double tap like that is not a valid tap out. One must tap at least three times. So I was not aware that there was a numerical quotient on the tap. But he goes on to say a Brazilian tap is a way to try to trick an inexperienced opponent into thinking you've tapped out so they release the hold and you can attempt to go on to win the contest. <coughs> a dirty pool, but something educated modern fight fans may recognize. And then he linked to a story on the the underhanded technique, he says. But so that apparently is a thing. And then somebody else yep. on Twitter, I believe John it was, Deere. said that in Germany, I'm sure John Deere doesn't maybe play for games, catch dude. wrestling or auto bonds or it's an established uh, uh, an established custom that that's that's a, yeah, a fake ta a fake out kind of a tap where you start to tap but you don't really and they, but they didn't explain it on the episode on the roof, of smackdown man. where they did it did they and i just tuned the announcers out i really do tune them out but i think they would have brought up some mission expert auto vons that would have paid attention that's how you well do i don't it, know what i mean just to, whether it's an auto vons promotion if thing that off, gunther may have yeah. But the point is, apparently this is a, a thing, and then on SmackDown, last night as we're recording this, oh, you fucker. they referenced it from oh, last week. Oh, he's up week, there. I, Michael Cole okay. I knew he was trying to explain somewhere. it, but the way that he explained it. I never knew you could get on that building. That's crazy. You, if you didn't, oh, if you didn't know what fence, I just like said and read what I just said, you wouldn't know it. what he had just said. It, it didn't make any sense, because apparently... He's seen the same oh, shit. I forgot. Biden opened and the borders. And people have explained it, and he fence. jotted he down notes, right or through. somebody told him, but here's what it was. But he he didn't say it that way either, or in a, in a manner in which anybody would have understood, but at least they're trying to explain it after the fact. But it was odd, because if you and I did not know that little factoid, then man. I would think that the you average guy good, from man. the gas station in fucking you Fernando, good, Mississippi nah, I'm getting you. would probably have been Stop confused, fucking. don't you think? Stuff like that. Especially again with no explanation at all from any of the commentators. Go farm me a fucking wheat field, you fucking and, uh, Or the one that we could understand a week later. Anyway, so that's that. The all-digital Xbox Series mm -hmm. S gives you next-gen speed and performance at an affordable price. Fast load times, yeah, the gameplay of Series S is complete FPS. dog shit, if you guys though, are interested, It's literally a potato. No one Series gives S. a fuck. If you buy the Series S, you're probably, you probably have less than one brain cell. You probably have half a brain cell if you buy the Series S or anything else. I'd much rather buy a GameCube for $50,000. That's bullshit. <clears throat> Well, but that was not all of the program, because the that? world title match, and everybody's smart, has a 60-minute time limit, so they put it on earlier in the program, so that, you know, people wouldn't be smart. Well, why does the world title match always end right on schedule? No, they're by the barn. But you know, now they right. got 30 minutes left in the show, and while that's a good idea to put the title why match on early in case it would know. go longer, you got to have something else to put on afterwards. So they come back after Brian Danielson versus Chris Jericho with Tony Storm and Hikaru Shida dude, against Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter. You Hader. need money for brain cells, dude. And this That's was 100 need. miles an hour back and forth, surgery, non-stop, making no sense whatsoever. Brain, a bunch of girls doing old moves. They don't need money for the figured out how to do it mid practicing to each other, one in turn, until finally Shida rolled up Britt Baker. Me, dude? Oh, and now you ask, what's he their main event going to be? He has to be. For the A and B title. I refuse title. to believe someone's that bad. Dude. Well, yeah. Well, remember, I've, I've mentioned this. That's oh, the man. original title. Of, you know, if you ever went down to the A and P grocery store with Aunt Lola to pick up a few things, the A and P was the Atlantic and Pacific <laughs> Tea Company. Hey, he got a kill. When they started in the shit. 1800s, that's and then they Somebody grew into the A and P grocery alarm. giant. 
So this is the <clears throat> A&P Championship, the Atlantic and Pacific, because they can't keep track <laughs> of which body of water Crap. these various people come from. Yeah, someone sent me an image the other day they said was from AEW. I don't know for sure, but it had like a Chinese flag. And they said, what part of the Atlantic is China from? <laughs> yeah. So it's the A&P title. And the A&P title was going to be defended by Pac against Pockets. And I can't tell you how many people on Twitter that when I got up the next day and I turned on the Twitter machine, says somebody checked on Cornette. Is Jim Cornette all right? They put a title, they put a championship on Pockets. Did anybody think that I would be mad that a pretend wrestler won a fake title in this company i didn't watch this for for another reason because why would you i'm only watching the serious shit and even some of that even though they may intend it to be serious is not serious so uh, but again you know they did me a favor here i got skipped 15 minutes of aew but wasn't the idea of the all Atlantic title because Pac is from the United Kingdom and they wanted to give him something because he's supposed to be a serious top guy. We heard he was signed for a multi-year contract. He's been there. He's been gone. He's been back and forth. He looks like a million dollars and can't put a match together to save his fucking life. If you held a gun to his head and his family was being dangled over a cliff. Apparently, he still couldn't put a fucking match together. It makes sense, but he's still supposed to be one of the serious top guys, right? You have 10 seconds to find the secret code. Look for a 10-letter word somewhere on the screen. Right? And pockets be... Oh, all righty. So the top of dynamite... Out comes the brand new announcer. They got another announcer. And it is, of course, the inimitable Renee Paquette Moxley Good. She sounds like a British dowager, member of the upper crust. Renee Paquette Moxley Good. And she's obviously John Moxley's wife and is part of the new contract, apparently. Everybody's family gets a job. Okay, she's been a recognized wrestling personality with the WWE on their announce staff and broadcasting staff before. So I got to be honest, I don't know if I ever paid any close attention or if we were even watching the program when she was on it. But all right, let's see. How are they going to feature her on her debut? Is she the sideline reporter that asks incisive questions? Is she giving background information as part of the broadcast team on events that are happening hither and yon in the arena what pithy part is she going to play in this program and she came out and was happy to be there and introduced canada's own christian cage and asked this question of christian cage how does it feel to be back in toronto and that was the last goddamn thing she said in this fucking <laughs> So, I'm not knocking her. They didn't give her anything to do. To, she, she's here and she, hey, how's it to be back in Toronto? A, a monkey could have asked that question. So, I, I don't know. But anyway, she's here. They didn't give her a question to ask or anything to to do with this interview. And then Christian knocks Toronto and introduces Dino Douche. And by the time Dino comes out to the stage, Renee is good and gone. (laughs) And that was that. Very good. Very well done. So (laughs) then, well, I tell you. Speaking of liking something in the ring, they actually did something that I did like, and they've got something going, and it's over, and by the end of this, they managed to shit on it, too. Billy Gunn versus Swerve. The crowd was singing. You know that Keith Lee thing, out of the past in my glory, or whatever, scissor me daddy. This 
It's incredible. This is such bullshit, and they're loving it, and it's over, but it's not bullshit that makes oh, the whole leaving? business look right. fake. It's bullshit that makes these baby faces look like they're crazy. It's updated fucking handsome Jimmy Boogie Woogie Man Valiant. Billy Gunn's 58 years old, looks great, and he's more over than ever. And a pro wrestling match broke out. I couldn't believe it. They were actually working. Billy's not going to go out there and do all that stupid bullshit. He's a pro. He hot dog like a baby face for a little bit, and then he got cut off, and the heel gets heat on him. They go through a break. They come back. A little bit more heat. Billy hits a tilt a whirl. Both of them sell. Billy makes a comeback. Hits a jackhammer. Goes for the famouser. Misses that or is foiled in that. Swerve takes over. Gets a nice two count. He's hiding in the basement. Then like they do back and forth is. a little bit, and Swerve rolls through and grabbed the rope, which had to be a Billy Gunn finish, because not only was it a nice match and a nice finish, but good position on the finish. And I would have to think that none of these other numb nuts know how to position themselves for shit like this. So Billy gets in there, gets Swerve over, has a nice, uninsulting segment. And as soon as it's over, and, and obviously Billy needs to do the job because Swerve, and if we ever see Keith Lee again, the other part of the tag team that they're fighting, um, then the acclaimed needs to get even for Daddy getting beat. And so everything was fine, and it made perfect sense. And then here comes Mark Sterling and Tony Nese out on the stage. And I swear to God, if you... <laughs> If you said to somebody, this team is red hot. Movie, you stupid idiot, dude. The fans He's love them. In the basement, they're they're like loving a just silly baller, shit dude. that they're doing. They're just captivated by them. How can we involve them in people with people that nobody cares about in okay. such a way that we will take away the thing that's making them popular? <laughs> I've got an idea. So Mark Sterling, the fake lawyer, comes out and says that he's trademarked the phrase scissor me. And so that means that the acclaimed and Billy Gunn can't do it anymore. And they start to do it anyway, and he says, oh, no, 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 I'll sue you. So now they're standing there like dicks, like this fucking putz that everybody can see is a fake. A mile away, Mark Sterling, he's not a lawyer. This is bullshit. And he doesn't do it well, because it's phony, and he's winking at everybody, and it's over-the-top comedic. He's playing the part of a heel manager lawyer. And nobody gives a shit about Tony Nese, because nobody's ever seen him win a fucking match. This is garbage. And they bring, and they put these, the acclaimed in with this preliminary bullshit as a red herring and take away their scissoring what the fuck what in the world does sterling have pictures of tony wanking a dog we are about to achieve victory, your thoughts i don't know about these pictures but the wrestling news will report them if they turn up I don't know why, I told you before. There are certain guys that make you cringe as soon as they come out during a segment. As soon as Mark Sterling's voice was heard, I said, Oh no, why are you gonna ruin this again? I don't care if he's a nice guy, he's been used like shit, so that's the way we think of him. I love Swerve as a heel. Man, every time I see Swerve, I'm more and more sold on Swerve. Yeah. Billy Gunn probably wakes up in the morning and says, I can't believe this is happening to me. <laughs> Again, I can't believe this is happening to me. They just had a DX reunion. And look at the position he's in. He's actually happening right now. Yeah. The acclaimed are over. And I worry about how over they'll be when the booking gets done with them. Social media is wild. Hootsuite helps brands revive and brand. Our tools map out marketing campaigns and make talking to customers easy. Then the Ring of Honor title match that they've advertised, Chris Jericho is going to destroy the honor of Ring of Honor against Brian Danielson. And they brought Ian Riccoboni in, as you said, and he should be 
in sock face's spot as the lead AEW announcer. He's the best young wrestling announcer that I know of in the industry today. And does a great job and is very camera friendly, blah, blah, blah. But instead, we got this pretend phony wannabe ex outlaw wrestler who still clings to his own delusional memories of the non existent past triumphs he's had in the industry and presents himself on TV as a veteran wrestler. Hey, he says something. What does Shivani say? Why Shivani in the third seat? To do what? To do what? He says nothing. I'm not disagreeing and, and with you. You don't disagree with me. I'm not disagreeing with you. So, but anyway, Jericho and Danielson. These guys have worked um teen times. Danielson's brilliant. Jericho was in Toronto, and I've got to give him this. He upped his current game. He worked hard on this. Even, even the hurricane run off the top rope, going to the break. The crowd, of course, was singing Judas a cappella, which is, again, the heels music, but still. So Jericho worked like he took 10 or 15 years off. It's Danielson. They had a good, logical back-and-forth match. The people were more into this than any WWE TV crowd is into the match. Because even though AEW has the rottenest most unprofessional matches their crowd wants to go to see good wrestling matches whereas the wwe has the most professional professionally executed matches they're not ridiculous or dangerous or nonsensical you know phony in that respect but their crowds are not there to see the wrestling matches so i don't know anyway Danielson got the Boston Crab on Jericho. The fans loved it, chanted, this is awesome. Uh, Danielson went for the elbows. Jericho Fireman's carried him out, missed a lion saw. Danielson hits a knee. Uh, you know, uh, but again, he went for it. And, and then the third time, Jericho turned it into a code breaker, got a two count. I mean, they're not dogging it. They're working hard. And finally... Jericho shoves Danielson into the referee. And old Daddy Mac tosses the, one of the championship belts, however many they have, to Jericho. And he milks using it. And he was standing there while Danielson was standing up. Jericho looked frozen in cement. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? What is he waiting on? Why is he just going, get up, get up? Why do you have to wait for the guy to get up before you hit him and knock him back down again? And then I realized, because here comes Garcia, old Danny Garcia, running down to the ring with another belt. He's the Ring of Honor pure champion. And he's running down with the, his belt, but then he drops that belt to roll in the ring and pull Jericho's belt away from him. So that was what was going on. Jericho was waiting for Danielson to stand up, Danielson didn't want to stand up until he saw Garcia coming because then if he stood up, Jericho would have to hit him and he wasn't supposed to hit him. And apparently Garcia was a day late and a dollar short of getting down there. So finally, he runs down with a championship belt, drops that belt to roll in the ring and pull the belt that Jericho's got away from him. And then uh, as Jericho turns around, Danielson hits him with a big knee, boom. And then Garcia is holding that belt that he's just pulled away from Jericho. And he rushes over and wipes out Danielson with it. Ladies and gentlemen, shit stain is all elite. A standard, nonsensical, illogical WWE slash shit stain style swerve. If Garcia was going to turn on oh, fucking Danielson, then why did he run down and pull the belt away from Jericho, who was about to hit Danielson over the head? And in Jericho covered him one, two, three. So now, Garcia, after weeks of back and forth about whether he was a wrestler or a sports entertainer, 
has turned heel and joined back with Jericho and the sports entertainers. And by Garcia turning heel and knocking the baby face out with a title belt and fucking him out of the Ring of Honor title, he got a huge baby face pop for doing that. So, what the fuck's going on here? It's terrible. I mean, it's terrible. Jericho is just taking over the show. It's totally nonstop Jericho, as I said previously. But Jericho's going to do everything in his power to get Garcia to be his guy. Moxley's doing everything in his power to have Yuta as his guy. And these guys are being force-fed on the show. Garcia would have been a lot better before he started talking. And then every time he talked, it sounded like a child saying child shit. Because that's all Jericho's programs. Danielson, man, the guy, he's went from being one of my favorite guys to I don't even, like, it doesn't make me pause anymore when he's on TV. Remember when he was doing those great interviews, those lab interviews in the ring where he was such a subtle, smarmy little heel and just brilliant? What's the last time we heard him talk? Did he go to AEW just to coast, or is it just he's a fantastic wrestler who does not want to see that? I don't want to speak up and say I'm not going to do bad shit, but unless he doesn't think it's bad shit, but it's terrible the way he's been used. It's atrocious the way he's been used. Jericho is now beating his wife in the hell. He beat him in the uh, stadium match where he got beat cussed, and then he beat him here. Did he beat him a third time? I can't remember. I don't, all I can remember is fucking Killer Kowalski and Mad Dog Vachon in Montreal. If Dan is a healing, had continued to develop at the point where they just completely decided to make him a baby face with the black people. He should have been in the top heel spot where Jericho is right now. And the show would be better right now if we had a heel Brian Danielson with whatever world championship at this point. They made titles meaningless. Everyone has a belt. Everyone has a belt. The people in the match have belts. The people running in have belts. <laughs> So when he comes down with belts, they have to drop so they have hands free to grab more belts. But everyone's a champion, everyone's a belt, they made it meaningless. Again, Danielson could have been the top heel. Or, you know, as, as top heel as anyone could be other than MJF. But instead we got all this Jericho shit, and I'll give him credit. I think he's working as hard as he has in a very long time in the ring. Of course, it's so he can make sure that he books himself to beat everyone. Right. But he's looked the best he has physically in the ring in a very long time. <sighs> well, but that was not all of the program. Rack up the Mary all season long at Nordstrom Rack. Fun free gifts for everyone and save 70% on the best brand. Rack up the Mary and save big in stores on our app and online. So they had a birthday party for the Miz. And his wife, Maurice, not to be confused <laughs> with one of the brothers, Gib, Maurice introduced him and they had to, it was a wwe monday night raw segment it was like vince had never left he comes out the ring is decorated with balloons and tables and gifts and an ice sculpture and as usual for the wwe way overdone and clownish looking and oh, i'm not going to spend time on this because it's cut off my toe and feed it to me but Maurice gave Miz two big red balls with his picture on them. Two massive balls to fit his big giant bat. Because he carried a baseball bat to the ring with him. Everybody now in, in uh, wrestling wants to play baseball. Taking my gimmick, the Louisville Slugger. How many people now carry a baseball bat in wrestling? 
Uh, Jericho has a bat. Yeah. He has a bat occasionally. Uh, who else uses a bat? Sting has a bat. Okay. That's right. We've lost the lead. Right? And then there was the whole Ronda Rousey and Liv Morgan thing. They've been using the bat. Now Miz has a bat. Remember when it was just Bill Watts walking tall? Anyway, oh, Miz goes to look at the rest of his gifts. He picks up a box off of the table that is set up in the ring by Miz's wife for his birthday. And what you know, Dexter Loomis's head is in the box. It's like the old Dick in the Box spot. He picks the <laughs> box with no bottom up, and there's Dexter Loomis's head sticking out from under the table. So he puts the box I don't back on the real head, physical face your head. the bat and starts bashing the box in. But of course, Dexter has disappeared because he's gone underneath the trap door. Mother I mean, this is Magic Elementary 101. And his... The old Miz is standing there. Loomis comes up from under the ring back behind him. Oh, and grabs hold of him and he's going to choke him out or put a sleeper on him or whatever. Miz is flailing his feet and kicks... Reese, but she so stopped loud. short of the table with the cake on it in a phony and overly dramatized way to indicate that she didn't go in the cake. And then, apparently, the spot was supposed to be that he was still kicking and would kick his oh, feet up and going? shove her into the cake the second time. But she was, I don't know if she's too far away from him. He didn't get his foot up far enough. He put his foot in her ass and kind of shoved. And she stumbled forward Bruh. and tripped and missed the cake. Missed the cake. Her face went to the Bruh, side of the cake. The and then she fell behind the table and on the way down had to grab some of the icing on the way by with her left hand and smear it. A little bit on her face because is that the first time Brian in the history of wrestling the heel has missed the cake? You would be an expert, you never missed the cake. You broke your nose or you got a bloody nose in the cake. I didn't break it, but I got a bloody one one time. I, 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 I've never seen anybody miss the cake. Actually, let me stop you. Didn't it happen in AEW? Am I wrong to think they did a cake angle with Mark Sterling or something and he missed the cake? Well, you know, no, he still got some on him. Okay. I mean, she completely missed it. I think he got some on him, but did that? No, they tried. There was a. It was like a pie in the face where they were throwing it, and the, the thrower missed mostly, or something like that. But this was a. This was a complete whip. Missed the cake. So How then, dare you miss the cake? explain this out to me. Miz then ran off. From got loose from Loomis and ran off. Maurice looks at Loomis and they stare at each other. Maurice runs out and scores Dude, you have terrible play more play more plays, man. Dude, you're trash. Loomis shows up and picks up the trash. cake knife and then he stabs the air <laughs> out of the balls. And the crowd is silent and then he looks at the cake. And then to entertain themselves, the crowd starts chanting, eat the cake, eat the cake. And he takes a bite, and that's the only pop of the second. What happened here? This Loomis Miss stuff isn't going away either, is it? Not a bit. Who <laughs> the kick out of this? You know, he's just well, like uh... a serial killer. It's not even that. He's like a weird stalker who's never... It's not that people don't stop him. No one does anything. They just let him do whatever he wants. He pops up every week, kills the Miz, and then pops up again. But he's not dangerous because he never does anything that leaves a lasting mark on anybody. Is he still married to Indy Hartwell? I don't think so because she's not on the program anymore. She's not on NXT. Is she? She is. When you're XO, the video is going around because it's such a unique thing. Last night on NXT, it was really great. She won a match with a super blessed. Well, bless her heart. Well, anyway, moving on. Uh, DX was in the back of the arena talking to the two job guys that are about to face almost. And then Miz and his cake lady came in upset with his deflated balls. And <laughs> Road Dog apparently, can make matches now on television. 
And I mean, I know he's back working in the office, but I don't think they've said that on TV. The announcers joked about it a time or two. But Road Dog made a match for next week where it'll be Miz versus Dexter Loomis, Balls versus Lead Town. Is that the way I understood it? I don't know. If Loomis loses, he's got to leave town, but if Loomis wins, then he gets Mrs. Balls or something. I don't know. <laughs> and then almost beat the two job guys. This is actually the best he's ever looked. Almost. This is this is all he ever needs to do on television. And we would have a better opinion of him if this is all he ever had done on television. We saw him have a match with Bobby Lat two matches, I think, with Bobby Lashley. We saw him have competitive matches with or try to have them with a couple of other recognized names. All you need to do with this guy, give him a couple of job guys and let him beat him in two minutes. That's the only way he's oh, ever going to look Imagine good. And this was the Andre formula. Enemy How many competitive airborne. matches did Andre the Giant ever have on free television ever? Not too many. Man. Only in Mid-South. Yeah. Only in Mid-South Rev. Watts could talk him into it. And Watts' way of presenting him made it made him look even better. But alright. So and then they beat TR at the Bray Wyatt return. And we've already spoken about that and what my issue is between that supernatural and Undertaker Supernatural. to the show i just watched tales from the territories andy kaufman versus the king of memphis i've always been interested in this story and i watched a show about a year ago plus i saw a man on the moon that touched on this part of his life they mentioned that jimmy Burnett was a photographer in the show so my question is what does jim remember about this you since he was there during this time period i thought the foxy angle was a work but Lawler insinuated it was a shoot match, and he also said the slap on David Letterman was not planned. What was Jim's take on the angle and this episode? I remember it ran on and on for weeks with the original angle, him hiring bounty hunters, him and Hart arguing, then him connecting with Lawler, and back and forth angle for several weeks in the house. Oh, it was like a year and a half after the initial, I initial, As initial match. It was a year and a half until finally, I think they wound it up like November of 83, which was the last time Andy had come down. He had just found out that he was sick and had cancer. And obviously, that's the only reason he didn't come back. Um, okay, and, and obviously the... The program, the Tales from the Territories, that was just on last night as we speak that he's referring to... Uh, last week it was just Memphis wrestling in general. This was the uh, Kaufman centric episode with Lawler and Dutch and Jimmy Hart, Jerry Jarrett, Jeff Jarrett. And uh, by the way, 10 o'clock Eastern Time on Vice TV for Tales from the Territories. Um, my mother would have got a bigger kick out of watching that show last night than she would have seen me on television in person because so many of my pictures were were featured on that show, the Kaufman and, and the stuff with the picture of Foxy on top of Kaufman and Andy looking like a rat trying to find a corner in a silo was mine. And my mother always got a bigger kick out of seeing my pictures somewhere throughout a fucking major arena. And he was fast. And you know those pit... It's not just the wrestlers that do wacky stuff, but lots of wrestlers do, Jim. And on that topic, let's address this here at the top of the show or at least 30 minutes into the show. <laughs> this clip that everyone's sending around, because, of course, if, as soon as anything wacky happens in wrestling, they have to send it to us nonstop. 
The video of a man apparently being pinned by a dog. What are your thoughts on this? And the fact that something like this goes viral. And uh, in case you need to see it and haven't seen it and have ignored the tweet. You've sent it to me. I've also emailed it to you just in case. Yes, and I thought I had successfully uh, avoided this. Yes, like 500 people tweeted me, what do you think, or have you seen this, or your comments on this, or whatever the case, over the past couple days, and since I've had other things going on, I successfully, I saw a dog in the ring. I said, this is not something I want to see. I, I don't want to get mad at a dog. It's not the dog's fault. There's going to be some foolishness, and I don't want to, you know, <laughs> see what it was. But now you're asking me about it, and you have sent it to me, and you are uh, requesting that I watch it. So I'll, I'll hey, click on it. Is there any, any preface for this that we need or whatever? I know there's a dog in the ring, and man wrestles dog is all I've heard. <laughs> man no, wrestles dog. No, there's no other preface that I can give you because I don't know where this is, That's who these people me. are. What this is a part of, and let's keep it in that way. We don't and, need to give them any publicity. And let's also make sure we do. And by the way, it looks like you're trending right now for some reason. But let's no, also make no. sure that we note, for the record, for those of you that just <laughs> listened to the visual and Jim Cornette's reaction, there aren't that many people here. It appears to be in either a shutdown mall or <laughs> or a Walmart or something, or one that maybe just has uh, wrestlers versus dogs on weekends. I'm really not sure. Okay, well, I wait a minute. I've clicked on it here. Hold on. How do you make the screen bigger on this, or can you? Well, it looks like I don't know if it's a Walmart. Oh, it looks like it's an outlaw Walmart. It looks like maybe it, you know that it it was a a Walmart type of building at one point, but now maybe there's like you said, just a flea market or something in it. Oh. And. Oh, hey, hey, hey. Apparently, this thing has gotten 442,000 likes. <laughs> Why choose proven quality speed from Steve Pepper? Because active days together start the night before. On the Smartbed, proven for 5,000 likes. <laughs> what are these guys? So it's 34 seconds. You want me to just go ahead and watch the goddamn thing? And I'm going to watch it with you. I haven't uh, watched we'll it yet. Oh, well, then in that right? case, then, then we'll, we'll just goddamn watch it oh, together. Oh, my first ever time right, making that glitch jump. Holy play. shit, let's go. Play whatever you want. Wait a minute, is, is that the other page? No, I've never done this before. That's kind of cute. That is not Ethan Page, though. Never before done by me. Holy shit. Animals, so I don't think he would do this. Well, at least we haven't seen it in public. All right, tell me when to hit play. One, two, three, hit play now. And then there's a, a dog with a red-headed oh. woman. Oh, it's a cute little white and gray dog, and it obviously is not happy about being in there, so the girl that owns it has to get in. She, he jumps up on the wrestler, and the wrestler takes a bump, and now he jumps up on the wrestler's back. Well, my dogs used to do this when I was a kid. If you get on your hands and knees, they'll jump up on your back. And he jumped on him, and and he's got his feet on his chest, and he's pinned him. Well, let's just swell. Why is that not interference? The redheaded woman ran it. Well, uh, yeah, the manager's in the ring. It should have been a disqualification. Um, I mean, you know, what the hell? Why, would, why, what is the, the reason why that this guy would want to do this if he is an actual wrestler or thinks he's an actual wrestler obviously he was an actual wrestler he wouldn't be involved in this show but what's the reason for him to take phony bumps for a dog and shit on the building even if it's, if it's the dog's birthday the dog doesn't want, look like it wants to be in the ring to begin with so it's not like you're doing something for the dog it looks like the dog's a little nervous of the people until the redhead gets in the ring because the redhead is mommy. But, so, did this guy buy boots and tights and say, I hate the wrestling business, so I'm going to make a joke out of it in front of as many people as will sit and watch me? Which apparently is 36. 
There's other people walking by in the background, but it looks like they're just walking to craft booths that are not a part of this. There's literally like maybe 28 people sitting here paying attention to this. Give them credit. It'd be hard if I was going from like a candle shop to the coffee guy. And I saw, hey, there's a guy in a room with a dog. What the hell's going on? I'd make stop and see what's going on. Well, see now that the redhead is holding the dog's head. But the other guy ain't doing his job properly. He's taking phony bumps. Well, of course, outlaw mud show shit happens. Like, what visually appears to be an outlaw mud show but, here. But let me ask you. But, but I'm just, what, what is this guy's purpose? What is his reason for this? Why would you do this? Even if you're just a play wrestler that works for free on weekends in fucking flea markets like this. I got that guy. Oh, you involved in it, and you're doing something that, if you do it right and if you do it wrong, punishes your body. So you, instead of going out and, like guys used to do, living their weekend warrior fantasy of being a real professional wrestler, even though they got a job at a plumbing company, and they would try to tell their co-workers to fight how tough they were, and that they were pro wrestlers now these guys want to make wrestling look as silly and phony and stupid and as easy to do for anybody as possible where is what is the psychology there you know i think unfortunately there is a generation of people who came up as wrestling fans and got involved with wrestling and their mentality and i think a lot of it comes from the stuff they grew up watching on wwe tv and various what was this game, huh? Huh? Uh, in less oh, wow. fashions okay. of the band in wwe tv the idea that anything is acceptable in a wrestling room it's a canvas where as long as there is some sort of physical activity it can involve animals or lightning or fire, or all sorts of crazy shit. I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't see that as disrespecting the business. They see the business as being a clown show where anything is possible. Well, and that's, and you can tell the ones that see the business as a clown show. And those are the ones that we generally uh, rail against here on this program, because that's not just limited to the small budget promotions either. But is anything physical that can involve animals that say you didn't want to you didn't want to google that the other day when i asked you to things physical that could involve animals what do you want me to google exactly here i'm just talking about you didn't want to google it earlier right but you now use that to yeah. compare it to something yeah. what well i don't know it's i would actually i would say that i've seen a, a few videos Involving people getting physical with dogs and we're more entertaining than this one. So, you got that going for you, too. I don't know. Maybe this... I don't know if you have anything going for you there with that, but let me ask you this. You know, that was a thing one time. There was a tape going around in the 80s that every time a, a guy would watch it at home, when he was all by all alone by himself, he would realize that there was a dog somewhere in Germany that had a more interesting and better sex life than he did. Again, I don't know if these are the kind of tapes uh, that everyone was getting, but let me ask you this. You have seen Bob Barnett may have... No, Bob Barnett has nothing to do with that, goddammit. Oh, he was a different kind of tape trader in the 80s. Let me ask you this. You've seen other working dogs. <laughs> How does this dog rank as far as dogs who can do things in the ring or are naturally inclined? We've seen Matilda, oh, we've seen Arnold. I'm sure there are other ones I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. Enemy what are the dogs on uh, last year? Yeah, and good, good to bring that up because some people are going to, oh, well, Cornette liked it when the Steiners used their dog. This is a cute, fluffy dog. I, it looks like a smaller version of a collie. I don't know what the breed is. That's just jumping up and down with happiness and a wrestler uh, taking obviously fake bumps well off of it and laying there so that the trainer can get the dog to stand on it and, and pin, uh, stand on him and pin him. Save 70% on brands you love at Nordstrom Rack. <laughs> Find great gifts for everyone on your list. Yeah, stand on him and pin him. And boy, I wish that we had released some of the video. I don't know, did the, any of the video highlights of the 
Steiner Heavenly Bodies match in Smoky Mountain. Did we put that on television? Maybe it's out there somewhere. But oh, I don't know if I've ever seen it. Actually, I don't know. I don't. I've got I've got tapes of at least a, a couple of the matches. But Arnold Steiner was a goddamn massive pit bull that weighed over a hundred pounds with a head the size of a fucking toilet seat, and <laughs> you could hear his bark throughout a fucking major arena. And he was fast, and you know those pit bulls, they're all muscle anyway, right? And when he would get fired up, Scott had this big leash that he, you know, had Arnold on, and he would be straining to hold Arnold back, Scotty Steiner. And Arnold was great. He, he could work. He would chase the guys around the ring. And, you know, obviously, Scotty had the, the fucking leash or he would tie the leash to the ring post in the Steiner's corner and then they'd trip the heels and they would drag them over toward the corner of the ring and Arnold was big enough he could jump from the floor into the uh, up on the apron and underneath the bottom rope and he as that leash was like six feet from the post he would get either Tom or Jimmy Del Rey's uh, boot in his mouth and the whole fucking foot would disappear practically and he wouldn't bite down hard enough to you know to goddamn do any damage but he would it was working and the guys are going oh shit and there are other guys holding on to the guy's arm where he's having a tug of war with the fucking dog Ooh. and here's a pitbull falling somebody and it, it could work and, it, and then you would That's run from down. him and or Accidentally Ooh, step over it. Oh, oh my God. We didn't have, you know, the guys taking goofy bumps for the dog, but the dog oh, was awesome. Oh, awesome, maybe. In a legitimate and yeah. believable way, and the people love to see that dog chase after our asses. So, there's a difference there. It, it's like with everything in. In wrestling, there's context, and there's a big difference between trying to make something that could be legitimate, legitimate, and just going in and asking off to being a jack-off. But imagine if Arnold could do a drop kick and then be up by a woman's opinion. You could use Sherry for that role. She was on the show. Double No one cares about your damn gold ash. Mark Mero and Sage. Remember when they were gonna, uh, um, well, they, they revamped, they revamped Mero about three or four times, but they switched him heel at one point, tried to give him a new look and a new attitude, right? Because originally he'd come in as a baby face with her in his corner, and as I mentioned to Bruce, why the fuck is anybody going to hear him? He's got it's this plot right. with <clears throat> big hoo in his corner, and... What's, the, what's her purpose for being there? Well, she looks great. Well, what's her purpose? She's not his manager. A valet generally accompanies a an obnoxious, egotistical heel. So why is this guy that you want people to take as a baby face, who's only position in the business thus far has been impersonating Little Richard, why do you want her to come out with him, and what are the people supposed to think about it? Oh, yeah. they could do it. Well, they look great together. That was Bruce's thing. It was Vince's thing. It was never explained what her purpose was. So, Mark Merrill and Sable, this idea sheet. 
I think we should go on as scheduled with Merrill and Sable in regards to his new look and new attitude. Well, that's nice of him to say that. Since I don't know at the time that he was officially on the creative team. Here, that's what we got to narrow this time frame down. From there, I believe that Merrill should start abusing Sable out of jealousy. Oh, my God. Which in turn will turn the fans against him while they cheer for her. That was the problem originally. When he was a baby face, they cheered for her and he and she turned the fans against him. He was a spare prick at the wedding. He was useless. They were all looking at her. So anyway, he says she sh he should start abusing her, which in turn will turn the fans against him while they cheer for her. At the appropriate time, a top baby face, maybe dude love in parentheses, should go to the aid of Sable, who in turn will go with that baby face. Then at the appropriate time, wait a minute, a top baby face should go to the aid of Sable, who in turn will go with that baby face. Then at the appropriate time, Sable will screw the baby face in favor of Mero. In other words, it was a work orchestrated between Mero and Sable all along, thus firmly pitting the fans against them. It's absolutely Vince Russo because it's a swerve. The swerve. Yeah. And actually, he's stealing and didn't even know it. He's stealing the fucking dirty white girl and dirty white boy and Tom Pritchard angle from Alabama 10 years previously, and he didn't know because he'd never seen that. However, I love it. He says at the appropriate time, a top baby face may be dude. I'm pretty sure this is in one of Cactus's books, but it, 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 if it's not or even if it is, there was a time and it may have been WrestleMania 97 that it would fit. There was a time where the idea was, and maybe, you know, maybe it's 98, I can't remember, but the idea was for... And it could have been 98, because Mick was figured in by then. So it had to be 97. The idea was Mick Foley versus Mark Merrill in some respect. Right? We're following along this idea. And they told me to call Mick and tell him that he'd be on WrestleMania wrestling Mark Merrill. And this, and this idea that they had involving Sable. And I called him up and I pushed it to him and there was silence on the phone. And he was saying, horny? I don't know if anyone's ever asked you this before, but is it okay if I'm just not on WrestleMania? Because <laughs> <laughs> he knew it was, it was death. He didn't want to work on WrestleMania with Mark Merrill over Stable. So anyway, they, they changed. Number two on this idea sheet. Tiger Ali Singh. Remember him, Tiger King Singh's son? Another of the... He was like the... Hindu from Ontario hey, version of life. Carlos Colon's kids in Puerto Rico. He'd always been the, the hero's son, and he assumed he was, you know, destined for greatness. So, hey, actually, the shit's thing here, you know, sooner or later, a blind squirrel will find you, hey, and I've life. got to say that sooner or later, I always knew I would agree with something he said, and here it is. Tiger Ali Singh, just let the guy be himself and the fans will genuinely hate him in capital letters. Doug Furness and Phil LaFon. One of the great tag teams of the 90s for all Japan wrestling, but by this point, LaFon's knees were shot and he was not the, the guy that he once was. And Doug Furness was a beast and the world's strongest man and an athletic marvel. But they didn't fit in the WWF at the time, like a lot of just good working tag teams did. And I think that's right around the time people started to realize just how beat up the All Japan guys were. Yeah, because they've been in All Japan for 10 years. Furnace and LaFon blanket them in the Japanese flag and have Yokozuna and the Patriot join their cause at the appropriate what? time. <laughs> Yokozuna and the Patriot? The soldiers of the rising sun. So he's going to turn Del Wilkes the Patriot. This is, okay, this is summer of 97, because Del had just come in by that point. Yokozuna was not let go at that point. Um, I think we may have, he may have been in Duke at that point. Uh, number four, Mark Henry. Let me come back. Wait, hold on. You're going, you're going wait, way too fast past the Sons of the Rising oh, Sun. Oh, okay. Sons of the Soldiers of the Rising Sun. Soldiers of the Rising Sun. So it's, 
Firmus and Lafon draped in Japanese flags with Yokozuna and the Patriot? Yes. Yes. Okay. Maybe, maybe you didn't go too fast fast. No. <laughs> yeah, see Firmus and Lafon, we saw they've done great in Japan. And, again, Vince Russo had never seen Doug Furness before he showed up in the WWF. He hadn't seen him in Continental. He hadn't seen him in Old Japan. He hadn't seen him on WCW. He didn't know what the fuck he could do. So the Patriot would have had a... The Patriot would have had to, to turn heel and become a Japanese sympathizer. He would have come out of the Bret Hart feud, upset that America didn't prevail over Canada, and announced that he's renouncing America, and he's joined forces with Yokozuna. Yes, who's Samoan. And number four, Mark Henry. As I, let me come back to this one. That's what it says. Let me come back to this one. Number five, Flash Funk. Remember Two Cold Scorpio, Flash Funk. Easy. Charles Skaggs and let him be his high-flying self. Flying with an apostrophe and no G. Maybe rub him up against Ahmed Johnson in their cause against the nation. Rub him up against them? Yeah. Is it a black thing? Yes, that's what it is. <laughs> Have a conversation with Skaggs and find out for yourself. Let him, I don't know what he's, let him denounce the gimmick and just do what he does best. Maybe the nation recruits him, maybe they don't. I think they do. He says no, they kick his ass. And perhaps he recruits Ahmed and Mark Henry to help him kick theirs. How about the posse? Let them be what they are, and that isn't a prejudice statement. Not no D on the end of prejudice. It's not a prejudice <laughs> statement. Wow. Remember, we have it, it's, it's, Stop everything you're doing, because Raid Shadow Legends just released a new yeah. legendary champion, and you can get it for free. All you have to do. How are you? Oh, Rick Bogner, right. the fake razor. Yeah. Rick Bogner, cut his hair, put him with Tom Brandy, and you have a beautiful Italian hitmen team. But real Italian gangsters, don't kill them by gimmicking them. I don't, I don't understand. How are you? Radio 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 Unlike what, Tony D'Angelo? Like, what does he say? I don't have any idea. How, if you, if, if a guy is obviously visually a gangster, an Italian, I don't know, they don't have a mafia type of thing. No, no, but if they did, yeah, if they did, that'd be something I will say. I'm not going to totally ship down that one because if you really think about timing wise, that would have been right before The Sopranos. So, timing wise, it may have worked out. With Tom Brandy and Rick Bogner. Well, no, I'm not saying. When you add the details, then it kind of kills it. I think Tom Brandy is Italian. Yes. And, and sincerely. You know, Italian, yeah. Sin sincerely. I don't know about Bogner. Is Bogner an Italian name? <sighs> All right. Remember Bracus. Oh, good his, for that. His real yeah, name was Ockham Albrecht. And he was a German bodybuilder with a freakish physique. And... Nice guy, and even the combined efforts of Tom Pritchard, Dory Funk Jr., and everybody else involved could not teach him how to wrestle. Rackus! Rackus will be over the same way Ahmed was. By looking at him, everyone will want to be him. What? Enemy UAV is airborne. Either he thought that he wanted to be Ahmed. Who knew? Or, or he... Now, bear in mind who's writing this and who the audience is. He knows that Vince is wrapped up in the physiques and, and everything, so potentially, but I don't know that anybody ever looked at Brackus and said, I want to be that guy. Especially after they saw him try to wrestle. Um... We are about to achieve a big uh, Yes. And remember, he, he had the robot arms in a shoot fight. Imagine how he worked. shit out. The Draws is a suicidal, suicidal, crazed football player who was cut from the NFL because he was unbalanced, a deranged and disturbed McMichael, who was on the other channel, Steve McMichael. I don't think he meant to say that he wanted Draws to be suicidal. I think he was mixing that up with, because, you know, shit Shitstain used to watch ECW for all of his ideas because... He couldn't figure out any of his own uh, that applied to wrestling. 
So, I think he's more of a homicide or even genocide. He's going for the Sabu tagline, so a homicidal, suicidal, genocide. But he picked out. I don't think he wanted draws to be depressed. Can you move, dude? Can you move? Can you move? This was the first time that was really he between Taz and Sabu. Yeah. Taz was the person in charge of making the shirts for ECW, at least at that point. And the Sabu shirt you said homocidal, not homicidal. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> you misspelled homicidal, so it's homocidal. And a lot of people back then were pointing the fingers at Taz saying, that's how much he hates Sabu. That's what he did. Never proven, though. A lot of people can't spell. <laughs> that's true, too. And when you... Point a finger at someone else, you have three more pointing back at you. But uh, Lenny Poffo said that one time. Um, the power saw has just started up. I was say, was Lenny blowing himself while you just said that? Was Holy that? mackerel! Now, come on. He did not have to take any ribs out surgically to be able to do that. That was a complete rumor. It's not really limber. Number nine, the honky tonk man on our list of ideas from our favorite. Shit stain. Honky Tonk Man, say goodbye. In 1997, the Honky Tonk Man isn't going to cut it no matter how much he entertains us. And this was at the time, you'll recall, when Vince had brought Wayne back to manage Rockabilly, who was Billy Gunn, as they were trying to rehabilitate him. Harley is in the background upset at the contractors for running the power saw downstairs. But she's so cute, we're going to leave it in. And by the way, so Wayne, now you know what Vince Russo thought of you in 1997. Wait, that was it? That was basically just fire honky That was just firing, just firing, yeah. Don't send him out to do public relations tour because people know who he is from the golden era. Don't fucking have him do radio stations or, you know, on sales or whatever. Just fire him, send him on. It would have been something if it was like, have him go away, come back all in leather, the comeback special. <laughs> Number 10, along these same lines of get the fuck out of here, Fatu. Please forgive me, but I think we've done everything with him that we possibly can. <laughs> and remember, kid, that they'd gone from the Samoan SWAT team to Fatu to the Sultan. <coughs> he was supposed to be Middle Eastern and, and wearing the fucking turban and... and as a matter of fact, one time, Vince, I've told this story, he called Fatu in to give him his notice. And Afa and Rosie and Jamal came with Fatu to the meeting, and when they left, they all four of them had jobs. He not only didn't fire Fatu, he hired the other three. Team Deathmatch. Obviously, before Rikishi, which would yes. elevate him to a new level. And, and finally, so we hadn't done everything with him we possibly could. He just needed to gain another hundred pounds and show his ass. Uh, number eleven, Bart Gunn. This one really troubles me. I think he's a keeper, but I don't know what you do with him. In looking at Bart again, forgive me. You see a good old boy. I don't, I don't know why you would forgive someone for saying that. He's a good old boy. I don't know if he's capable of overcoming that. He needs to work on his promos, which doesn't make it any easier. Number 12, Barry Windham. As remember, Windham and Bradshaw were the new blackjacks, which did wonders for the hair dye industry, but not for really really right, their careers. The Have him turn on Bradshaw and make him a modern-day redneck bounty hunter. Maybe the hit was made because somebody puts a bounty on the head of the blackjacks. A little bit of Bradshaw know, but his partner Wyndham was the one paid to do the job. That's all they were paying Barry Wyndham to do at that point was the job. Do you think the Italian tag team hired him to do the hit? You know, that would have thrown suspicion away from him. Listen to the next one. So, Barry Wyndham, eh, make him a bounty hunter or whatever, but Eric Watts. Eric Watts was still under contract from that Techno Team thing, right? Techno Team 2000, him and Chad Fortune. This is what he has to say. Could have elite potential. Read on. Elite in quotation marks. 
We're going to pause on that one for a second. So the original elite wrestler was Eric Watts? Hold on, hold on. Justin Bradshaw. What else can he be besides a badass cowboy, a really believable yeah, shit boy. kicker? Justin Hawk Bradshaw was a gimmick. Make him a badass cowboy, Dustin Rhodes with an edge. <laughs> Justin Hawk Bradshaw was a gimmick, but Justin Bradshaw as a cowboy is not a gimmick. Anyway, he didn't spend a lot of time at the bar with the wrestlers, right? Oh, Are no. you is on mine? No. And in terms of trying to figure out who Bradshaw was for real boy. versus the gimmick, what his knowledge would be would just be backstage conversation. Backstage in the locker room or on the phone or whatever. Um, and I'm not saying yeah, I didn't spend any time in the bar either, but I knew what the fuck the wrestling business was about. But here we go at the end. Uh, well, I'm going to transpose these last two. The last one on the list is Yokozuna. Yokozuna joined forces with Furnace, Lafon, and the Patriot, the soldiers of the rising sun. Or he could become a member of the Heart Foundation. Are there any details about how we would do that? Yes, yes, here's the details. There's a lot of history there, so it could make perfect sense. That's the explanation for why Yokozuna would join the Heart Foundation. What history? That they wrestled each other, I guess. But anyway, the last two names. Rockabilly and Jesse James. Oh! Which, of course, would become Billy Gunn and Road Dog, right? New Age Outlaws, yeah. Well, remember, Eric Watts could have elite potential. With Rockabilly and Jesse James, not easy, but simple. Simple. All you people are, you're just idiots, because this is simple. Billy Gunn and Jesse James can join Sean and Hunter as members of the elite. <laughs> He calls them the elite? He calls them the elite uh, because there was no Degeneration X at this point. Behind the scenes, <clears throat> these guys are a natural fit. Just let them be themselves and it'll work like a charm. Maybe Watts can fit in this group. Maybe. Can you have seen it? Billy Gunn, Road Dog, Shawn Michaels, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, and Eric Watts. You know what? If you want to say anything good about Vince Russo, he was certainly trying to do something nice for Bill Watts. But wait a minute. There's also another couple of suggestions. Maybe He says maybe Watts can fit in this group. Maybe he can't. Christopher can. He's talking about Brian Christopher. Christopher could have, and actually Christopher, Brian Christopher, as a over-the-top personality and a smartass would have fit right in, maybe. And then the last line, I swear to God, I'm reading this. I have it on paper. I will have it notarized if anybody believes I'm making it up. He's, so he's gone through the people that could be members of the elite. Shawn Michaels, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, possibly Billy Gunn, Jesse James, Road Dog, maybe Eric Watts, maybe not, Brian Christopher, and the last line, Sonny can fit. <coughs> he let them abuse her. <laughs> I swear to God. Why would they have to abuse her for her to fit in? <laughs> Because apparently all, all cool guys abuse their female fucking tag along is according to the ideas that this guy has. And he, oh, and he has to use the word abuse. <sighs> push fry, ice chai, <sighs> but anyway, that's uh, there's some more ideas from the font of knowledge. It started with abuse, it ended with abuse, and in the middle, he invented the elite. So, but now, you know, now that it all makes sense, because I've been seeing the current modern-day elite thinking, well, that, that's an idea that Shitstein would have had, and son of a bitch, it was. Well, you know, it's too bad that uh, instead of writing down some of these ideas,